Good morning, South Green Campus. We are uh, super glad you are here this morning. Uh, I don't know about you all, but that uh, pre-sermon music always intimidates me. Makes me think, man, this thing better be good. We are coming to you today, those of y'all who are watching across town at our Afton and Greenville campuses, want to give a shout out to y'all, glad you're here with us. We are coming to you from the beautiful Appalachian foothills of God's country that we call East Tennessee, or South Green. Uh, I noticed a a number of weeks ago when we were uh, getting things ready and coming and and, and setting up, uh, I walked out and I saw the foothills, and I thought, man, this is beautiful. When you see the colors of creation on a clear and sunny day like it might be in a couple hours, um, you walk out and you think, wow, that's beautiful. And the fullness of who God is, is better than we can imagine. It's better than that. Uh, If you're relatively new here, um, whether it's at Afton or Greenville or South Green, If you're one of our new friends, uh, believe me when I say we are so, so glad you are here today. Um, That so has three O's on it, by the way. Um, We're glad you're here, not because today is the first official day of of another campus for us, um, but because we have been praying and preparing for you. Uh, So that when you came in those doors today, uh, whether that was here at South Green or at Greenville or at Afton, that you were warmly greeted by someone who prayed and prepared themselves in their hearts and hands to welcome you to a church family where uh, we are focused on taking care of people and helping them to become who God called and created them to be. Uh, So we're glad you're here. We believe God sends We believe God sends people who need Jesus to those who are ready to receive them. And uh, so when we say we pray and prepare, it's so that we can take care of people he sends us. And so we're glad you're here uh, to be a part of that mission. And I want to say before we jump into John 16, I want you to listen closely to to something here um, that I think is important for us to say on a big hype day. (laughs) like today, um, beyond the hype of the billboards and the mailers and the yard signs, the heart of this church is to joyfully sacrifice our lives to shine a spotlight on the holy God who saw fit to offer the grace and glory of Jesus Christ to sinners like us. Uh, We're not here to raise the profile of First Christian Church. Uh, We're not here to grow from the momentum of little orange stickers in the backs of car windows. Uh, And we are not here to to major in craft bazaars and apple butter. We're here because God has called us, by his spirit, to train an army of warrior disciple makers who joyfully sacrifice their lives at the feet of Jesus for the sake of communicating his goodness and glory throughout Green County and the entire world. So we're glad you're here. Because that's what we're here to do. So let's get to it by God's word today. We're in chapter 16 of the book of John, verses 25 through 33. So please get that handy if you don't have it yet. John 16, verses 25 through 33. Uh, Today's sermon title is taken from the words of Jesus in verse 33 of our passage. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, I have overcome the world. You will want to have a Bible or the sermon guide on the app handy so you can follow along. Uh, The sermon guide on our app has all of the scriptures written out uh, if you need them. And at the beginning, there are going to be a lot of them that I'm not going to necessarily wait for you to look up. I'm just going to quote from them and keep on going at the beginning, so uh, you may want to have that handy. Also, please note that uh, there's a new Great Questions Answered post today. If you're new with this, Great Questions Answered is something where we'll answer something that is um, of particular sociocultural, theological significance, and uh, so you can find that on the app, on the Pulse tab, or under 
resources on fccgreen.org. All righty, let's get started by reviewing our memory verses for this third part of our study in the Gospel of John. It's called Exalting Christ, the Lamb of God, and it is chapters 15 through 31. And our memory verses are from John 17, 17 through 19. Um, just to stay on the same page, the little hyphen between the numbers, we say through, not to. So let's say that together, reference first, and then the verses. Here we go. John 17, 17 through 19. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Let's pray, friends. Holy God, we are gathered today to worship you and to return to you the glory and praise you alone deserve because you are eternal. You are ultimate in goodness, holiness, righteousness, glory, might, beauty, and power such that our greatest descriptions of you fail to do you justice. So we're gathered today because in you are found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and truth. And so we humble ourselves to the authority and the sufficiency of your holy word in our lives, asking that as we study together, as we we gather around your word, that you would continue to teach us and to feed us so that we would become the men and women you created and called us to be. Father, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would be the voice we hear, that your spirit would move in hearts, and that your will would be done through the people you've gathered together today. So that as a result of our time, as a result of submitting ourselves to your word, we would be formed and shaped according to it. So that you would be glorified in this church. Help us in our study today to more clearly see, more deeply love, and more closely follow your son Jesus as master and Lord. For the sake of communicating your goodness and glory, we pray in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Open in your Bibles, if you would, please, to the Gospel of John. John chapter 16, verses 25 through 33. John 16, verses 25 through 33. We are at the end of what's called the farewell discourse, uh, so-called because it's the last week before the cross, and Jesus is going to soon be leaving the disciples. And as he's been hinting since all the way back in Chapter 2, as he's been hinting, he was predicting that three days after he was killed, he would raise up the temple of his body. We see that in John 2, 19 through 22. He's been hinting at this idea that he would be leaving them ever since the very beginning. But the disciples, (laughs) they didn't really know what that meant yet. They didn't understand what would be coming, in fact, the very next day. They couldn't even understand what Jesus had been telling them all along, even about himself and his mission for them. And they most certainly had no conception of the kind of grief and sorrow and pain that they would soon encounter, both in the rejection and in the suffering of Jesus, and their own rejection and suffering. So here in John 16, it's Thursday evening, during that last Passover week, meaning it's the evening before Good Friday, and Jesus gives them some last-minute sort of pregame instructions here, gives them some instructions because not only would he soon be gone, and they would be temporarily dazed and confused at his death the next day, but they would soon be sort of taking on his mission. They would be carrying on for him. They would be sort of taking the field for the first time 
<laughs> only to experience what would initially be crippling losses and discouraging opposition at every turn. Things were going to become for them what Jesus calls at the end of our passage, tribulation, trials, trouble. So in John 16, starting at verse 25, he summarizes a number of things that he had been teaching them all along. And he's doing that to encourage and comfort them. And what he says is, they can believe in him. They can trust him. They can trust God's plans for him and for them because the Spirit's future leading would guide them even if they didn't have any understanding of what any of that would mean yet. Read along in John chapter 16, starting at verse 25. We'll read the whole passage and then we'll jump back in at verse 25. Jesus says this, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. We're going to unpack what he means by that at some great length, because it's helpful for us. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jump back to verse 25 and look at just that first sentence where Jesus says, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. I have said these things to you. I have been teaching you up to this point, he says, in figures of speech. What Jesus means here is not merely, not just that he has been using parables and stories up to this point, but he's saying that up to now, he has been speaking to them by sort of veiled and hidden and symbolic language that needed the eyes of faith to understand it. He's emphasizing here that his teachings could only be properly interpreted and understood with spiritual eyes, with the eyes of faith. So he was teaching what had been hidden before he came by using language that was still somewhat hidden. The writers of the Gospels and the New Testament tell us that Jesus had been speaking and teaching like this from the very beginning. And that he'd been doing so in part, as we said, so that those with eyes of faith could see and those with spiritual ears could hear. In Matthew 13, this is after the disciples asked Jesus why he taught in parables that were often kind of vague. Jesus explains in Matthew 13, verse 11, to you it has been given, speaking to the disciples, to you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, to the unbelieving crowds, it has not been given. And then in verses 13 to 16 there in Matthew 13, he says, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, referring to the crowds who did not see nor hear, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes, they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But he says this in verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. What does Jesus mean by all this, and why does he speak sort of cryptically? Mark says it this way in Mark 4, verse 33. 
He says this, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. As they were able to hear it. If the eyes and ears of faith, if the soft heart to hear from God was there. In a lot of places, the Apostle Paul picks up on this theme that Jesus' teachings are spiritual truths that are only understood by seeing and hearing. He says it this way in 1 Corinthians 2.13. He says, We impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. This is how Jesus taught. He taught in spiritual truths for those who could interpret those spiritual truths through a soft heart regenerated by the Spirit, the eyes and ears of faith. He taught here in figures of speech like this so that those with ears would hear and those without ears would not hear. This is the new wrinkle that often people don't think about in the teaching of Jesus. Because in fact, that's what the teachings of Jesus and the preaching of the gospel do. They gather God's people in Christ and they condemn those who reject him. It does both things. That's exactly what Jesus says to the Jewish teacher Nicodemus in John 3. In verse 3 of John 3, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, this rabbi, this teacher. In fact, he was a scribe. He was the sort of most well-educated of all of the Pharisees. He says this to Nicodemus in verse 3 of John 3. He says, unless one is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. And then in verse 5, he says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, spiritual cleansing, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then he applies this directly to Nicodemus, and he says this in verses 10 through 12. Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? We speak of what we know, and we bear witness to what we have seen. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? In John 5, 29, Jesus says, those who hear the voice of the Son of God will live. And then just a few verses later, he says that the evidence of those who do not believe is that they have never heard the Father's voice. They've never seen his form, and they do not have the Father's word abiding in them because they do not hear. In fact, in John 8, 37, Jesus says that those who were seeking to kill him were doing so because God's word finds no place in them. In John 8, 47, Jesus brings out explicitly the difference between those with spiritual eyes and those without. He says, whoever is of God, born of, from God, a child of God, whoever is of God, hears the words of God. Then he says, the reason you do not hear them, is that you are not from God. Jesus' own teaching was somewhat veiled and hidden in order to call out faith in his own people and to harden those rejecting him. He said so himself in John 9, 39. For judgment I came into this world, Jesus said, that those who do not see may see. And those who see, those who see, in quotes, those who think they see, may become blind. So the point here, in going through all of those verses, and the point here in John 16, verse 25, is that it wasn't just that you must have the eyes and ears of faith to understand Jesus' teaching, though that's true, but that this dynamic of needing to have spiritual eyes and ears is exactly why Jesus taught the way he did. He taught this way in order to call out faith in God's people and to harden those who reject him. And as we know throughout the Gospel of John, that meant opposition. That meant trouble, tribulation, opposition for Jesus. 
And since he would soon be sending out the disciples to do the same without him in the flesh, without him there to guide them, like sheep among wolves, he himself would say, they were worried, understandably worried, about how it would work, how the Spirit would lead them, how in the world were they going to be able to preach and teach like Jesus did in order to call out faith in God's people and to harden the faithless. And Jesus himself knows well (laughs) that what would be happening on the cross the very next day and in the tomb and being resurrected a couple days after that, a few days after that, that would throw the disciples for a loop and it would be the beginning of tempting them to give up and throw in the towel. So in John 16, 25, when Jesus says, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. He's actually continuing to bring them comfort and encouragement because he's saying, listen, things are going to become clear very soon. Things are going to become clearer. I've been saying these things in sort of hidden ways, but soon, verses 25 and 6, soon the hour is coming, the future, very soon, sooner than you think, the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly, he says, about the Father. If I'm one of the disciples, I think, finally, yes, (laughs) speak to us plainly, Jesus, please help us understand. And then he says this, (laughs) verses 26 and following, he says, in that day, That's the coming hour of verse 25. In that day, very soon, and yet still in the future, in that day, you will ask in my name. You will speak to the Father, and you will ask in my name. We talked a little bit about this last week, uh, and it's the same this week. This is, yes, about prayer and speaking to the Father because of what proceeds and follows. That's clear. And we touched on that some last week, but the key thing for us last week and this week is this. We we can talk to God. We have prayer life with God, and we can make requests of God in Jesus' name because he is for us the relational access to God the Father. He's saying here, it's because of what I'm about to accomplish that you don't yet see, that you don't yet know. It's because of that that you will have forever access to God the Father as a child of God. And you will ask in my name. The Spirit will come and you can ask in my name and you will have forever access to God because of what I'm about to do. You don't see it yet. You don't have any conception of what's about to happen the very next day. But it's going to be okay. So we know this is about prayer and speaking to the Father because of what proceeds and follows And so he says, in that day, you will ask in my name. But he says, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. He's saying, you won't need any prompting from me, Jesus speaking to them, because as he's already told them throughout chapters 14 to 16, they're going to have the Holy Spirit to guide them. But also because, get this, Jesus says, you won't need me to ask on your behalf because verse 27 For the Father himself loves you. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. In one sense, Jesus says, you won't need me around because of the intimacy of relationship you have with God the Father. The intimacy of relationship you have with God the Father who loves you And Jesus says, and you love him. You love him because he loves you. Why? Because anyone who loves is born of God. 1 John 4, 7 to 10. Love comes from God. But this intimacy of relationship between the father and his children isn't without Christ, but second half of verse 27, it's because of Christ. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. It's the result of what Jesus is about to do. 
That's why he puts the emphasis there on, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. He's saying, because what I'm about to do that you can't yet see, that you're not yet aware of, but I have to do for you, which means it's going to be better that I leave. Because of that, you will have forever relationship with God as father, between sinner and perfect God. That can't happen if I don't leave, y'all. I have to go. It's better for you that I leave. He'd said that many times before now. And so he's reiterating these things and summarizing to them a number of things that he's been saying all the way from the beginning of chapter 14 through now to encourage them. He has said this many times, and he says it again here. Verse 28. Here's why the access to God is possible. This is Jesus' mission. For I came from the Father, and I've come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. He said this many times about his mission. I was sent by God the Father into the world, and in John, the world is all of the institutions and people and, and ideas that are sort of aligned against the goodness of God. All the forces of evil aligned against God is what John means by the world. And so Jesus was sent into that context, into the context where all the forces of evil are aligned against what he was about to do for them. He says, this has been my mission from the beginning. I came from the Father, I've come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. He says again what he had said many times throughout John. And so he's summarizing in that first section to encourage them because they're about to take over. Because they've been confused. (laughs) They're about to be more confused. It's going to be rough for them in the next few days. But notice the disciples' reaction. Look at verses 29 to 30. We know as readers that they still can't possibly see what Jesus is about to do and what he's been saying here about his death and resurrection. But they start to talk a good game. Look at this, verse 29. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Which is a weird thing to say when according to John here, in the last few verses, Jesus has literally merely repeated the same things he's previously taught them for the, for the previous few chapters. Half of what he says is repetition from things he had alluded to and talked about earlier. Ah, oh, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. He's saying the same things to them he'd been saying all along. He's repeating the same things, but they declare, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Verse 30, now we know. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe, they say, that you came from God. What they say in verse 30 here, it sounds good, but notice that in verses 29 and 30, they say, now twice, now you are speaking plainly, and now we know. They say now twice, when six times in our passage before this, Jesus has spoken about speaking plainly in the future. Six times he talks about in that day, this will. Think about this. (laughs) He's made quite clear that they will understand soon, but not yet. In fact, in verse 26, Jesus says, in that day, they will speak with the Father, meaning not in this day, (laughs) but in that day. And that they will do so after Jesus has returned to the Father. So on the one hand, they're declaring rightly, correctly, in verses 29 to 30, that Jesus knows all things. They recognize that. And they, they, they say confidently, rightly, they believe that he came from God. But on the other hand, they are not only somewhat unaware of who Jesus really was, they are totally unaware of what he's about to do and their own struggles that lie ahead. 
And they were supremely confident in their ability to meet those challenges. John portrays them here as sort of immaturely confident and almost pretentious. Now we know. Now we know. (laughs) I can imagine Jesus sitting there going, you know nothing. You have no clue what I'm about to do in half a day from now. This is why Jesus answers them like this. Verse 31. Oh, do you, do you now believe? You have faith in me now. Really? When you're still in the locker room before the game, you haven't even taken the field? Yeah, you believe as far as you can see, but your trust is weak. It will fail. Verse 32. Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come within just a matter of hours when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Jesus says, every single one of you is going to flee when you see what happens. Every single one of you is going to betray me. Even the disciple whom Jesus loved, who wrote the apostle John here, who wrote this gospel, is going to betray Jesus. And he says, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Even when all of the rest abandon him, he has resources beyond them. And then Jesus ends with this encouragement. This is where we'll take uh, three points of application for the most part in just a bit here from verses 33 and following. Or verse 33 since it's the last one. (laughs) He ends with this encouragement. Verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me, that is what we call a purpose clause. I have said these things to you so that, in order that, for the purpose of, in me, you may have peace. I've told you these things, he says, so that in me, because of me, because of what I'm about to do on the cross and be resurrected and to ascend to the Father, Because of these things you can't even yet see, you can't even fathom about what this Messiah is about to do. They they had these conceptions of the Messiah being a socio-political and military leader who would bring the nation of Israel back to prominence. Maybe, Maybe this Messiah would raise up a new temple that would be more powerful than the other temples. In AD 70, the temple that they knew would would fall. They were hoping for a Messiah that would do those kinds of things for the most part. But he says, because you are fully identified with me in my upcoming death and resurrection and ascension to the Father, because of that, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. In the world, you will have trouble. But take heart, he says, I have overcome the world. Jesus says, indeed, you will. (laughs) He doesn't speak about it like it's going to be optional. He recognizes they're headed for suffering and pain. He says, indeed, you will face troubles and conflicts and opposition and trials and tribulation. But take heart. The word Jesus uses here for take heart Some translations say things like, be of good courage. It means to be firm or resolute in the face of danger or adverse circumstances. Jesus says, be firm in the face of danger. Be resolute, unwavering, unbending unmoved in the middle of adverse circumstances. He says, be strong and courageous. Why? Because I have overcome the world. I'm about to die on a cross that will tempt you to give up 
at least for a little while, will tempt you to give up during that time where you'll wonder, what is going on? My Savior's dead. What happened to all those promises? (laughs) A little while and I will be with you again, he said, multiple times. So three days later, they would see him raised from the dead. So why take heart? Why be strong and courageous? Why be firm and resolute, unbending, unbending, unwavering in the middle of adverse circumstances? Why? He says, I'll tell you exactly why. (laughs) Because I've overcome the world. Your courage won't cut it, he says. I have three brief take hearts for us to consider today. And the first is this. Take heart in God's plans, even when you can't see where they're going. Take heart in God's plans, even when you can't see where they're going. Notice I didn't say, take heart in God's plans when you can't see where they end up. (laughs) We know, Romans 8, 28 tells us, that where they end up is going to be God's glory and our good. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For most of us, it's not where it ends up that is the struggle. It's the next step or two or three where we're pretty sure because we've lived every step up to then that we know what the next step or three might be. And so our fears rest in that next step or three. We know that in the end it'll all be fine, but often the harder parts of life for us are the parts where we need to take heart in the cross of Christ and his righteousness for the next step. For most of us, It's not the steps we don't see where we end up for which we need courage, but the next one or three, the next one or two. It's the types of things that makes us, that make us anxious or that cause us undue worry or fear because we're the ones who have lived up to that and we know what can happen next. We feel like we know where this goes. It's your job that you think may have a tough turn or two ahead. It's your friend or your kid who's made a couple poor decisions and is struggling to to recover. It's your retirement account that doesn't seem to be going the right direction. It's your own recurring sin that keeps defeating you, and you feel that constant shame and regret that seem to predict for us what happens next. Think about this. The disciples had no earthly idea what would happen soon. But as much as they could understand it, as much as they knew, they would take heart in God's plans, even when they couldn't see where it was all going. Second, I think we needed to take heart to serve even when we can't see the fruit. Take heart to serve even when you can't see the fruit The reason we spent so much time at the beginning of today's message on the effect of Jesus' teaching is that the disciples were about to be sent to do the same thing Jesus had done in the same world where the forces of evil were aligned against their message to proclaim a gospel that would bring both people to God and send people away from him. And that was going to be way harder than they knew. Serving always is harder than you knew. Because it's, it's hard to serve when you don't know the results. If you want to serve at First Christian Church, don't ask us what the results are going to be. What we know is we are faithful to do what he's called us to do and that God brings the growth. I know that it's hard to serve when you don't know the results. It's hard to serve when it feels like maybe others around you aren't serving as much or the lead pastor just stands around and talks to people and you're sweeping. It's hard to serve when you wonder what your little P 
piece might be in the whole scheme of things. But, but notice that God doesn't ask us to make those decisions about our faithfulness <laughs> based on our knowledge of the end result or the effects or the fruit. He merely asks us to be everyday, boring, faithful servants who show up to do what he asks so that he can handle the results that we cannot. Friends, God doesn't use superstars. He uses regular old boring people like you and me to build his kingdom and to witness for the sake of the gospel. So take heart and be resolute to serve when you can't necessarily see the fruit. And then finally, take heart to engage even when you can't see the peace. Take heart to engage even when you can't see the peace. The constant, the constant drama and struggle of the last two and a half years of our post-COVID world uh, have made it tempting to circle the wagons and disengage. The constant drama of medical anxieties and political fighting and the resulting family tensions and job stress and educational strain and now economic recession, they've become, for so many of us, sort of this perfect storm of temptation to disengage from anything you cannot control to stay away from anything that creates any conflict or where we can't see the peace. But what I love about what Jesus says here is that it's not at all about what you can control in the first place. In fact, it never has been and it never will be. It's about remaining engaged in what you know you should do when tempted to retreat. It's about staying the course with the righteousness of Christ as the root of your courage. That's what he's saying here. He's saying it's about keeping on mission because of Christ's faithfulness to the Father's mission to you. And in every circumstance, it's about knowing that you don't have to manufacture courage on your own. You don't have to drum up self-born confidence. You don't have to drum up self-deceived trust in you. Why? Because Jesus has courageously faced the powers of evil and sin and hell on your behalf. So when Jesus offers himself for you, he's offering courage and strength you don't have and you don't have to have. So friends, take, take up his courage as your own. When he says, take heart, he doesn't say, take up your heart. He says, be resolute and firm. He says, take heart, be of good courage. Why? I have overcome the world. Take heart, because I have overcome the world, Jesus says. Let's pray, friends. Father in heaven, you are for us righteousness. We could never achieve and that we don't deserve. And so we give you praise and we give you glory for being for us the fullness of salvation that is joy eternal. For being for us courage in the face of sin, death, and hell. Help us to take heart so that we would be faithful. Help us to take your courage up so that as we serve, as we continue to engage, as we continue to be faithful, that you would be for us the peace we need. That our focus to do what you've called us and created us to be and to do would come from the cross. We love you for that amazing truth, Lord, and ask that it would continue to shape our lives for the sake of communicating your goodness and glory, we pray. Amen.